Welcome to Renatio's show. This is the podcast where I interview entrepreneurs and mavericks who get shit done. Hey, hey, what's up, my friend? So in today's episode, we have Sean Koo on the show. So Sean runs a marketing agency that helps business owners generate extra six or even seven figures per year. His secret? He employs a method called direct response marketing. And of course, we'll go into more details later on. But what's interesting is that direct response marketing can be applied across different industries, whether you're in finance, health and nutrition, you know, education, etc. The principles right, that are taught in direct response marketing right, works across this industry. So as long as you're a business owner or you're someone that sells something, right, today's episode will be relevant for you. And if you want to connect with Sean, I'll put his social media profile in the description below. Now, moving on, right? In today's episode, you'll learn number one, what is direct response marketing and how does it work? Two, we'll talk about what are the pros and cons of direct response marketing. Then we also cover, you know, what type of businesses are suitable right, or more suited for direct response marketing. Then we talk about how to actually improve and add campaign. What are some of the low hanging fruits to optimize so you can lower your cost per acquisition, cost per lead, right? And also towards the end, Sean will share, you know, how he actually started, right, his own e-commerce business, right, using the same principles, right, used in direct response marketing. So all this and more in today's episode, go listen to it right now. Okay, Sean, so welcome to the show, Sean. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so Sean, you're in the business, right, in the field of what we call a uh, direct response marketing, right, which helps, I think, businesses make money, a ton of money, right? So for people who don't understand what that means, maybe could you explain a little bit, you know, what you do? So in terms of like direct response, it's basically um, a style or type of advertising that calls for an action at the end. And, and it tends to be a little more, uh, as name suggests, direct in the sense of pointing out the pain points, suggesting uh, a possible promise that the service or product could deliver pain like a scenario of the kind of lifestyle or, or, or things like that, that this process could take you to. So it's usually a problem to a promised land kind of thing. And we would bridge that with like the client's product service. And so it tends to be in your face, like in the US, this style of marketing tends to be can be really aggressive. In Singapore, we tone it down a little bit. Uh, it's a bit more tasteful. So I think generally that is what that style is. And at the end, the KPI to that is usually just sales. Okay, so you mentioned earlier, right, that the US is more aggressive and Singapore is more toned down. Is it because of the demographics yeah. of the different countries where the US, they're more Accepting. okay with in my face? Yeah. Okay. So that, I guess, would have to also play a part as in the US, they're usually more vocal, more outspoken. So that's why they're more receptive towards such aggressive messages. Yeah. Okay. So what type of businesses would you say that would be a good fit for, for this model? I think every model has an opportunity to test this out. But so far, what has been proven to work is like the, the higher ticket financial uh, seminar, financial service, property, things like that. Um, that requires some form of like logical decision making and all that so that you could reason out. But the underlying of all that is actually emotions. So when we sort of write scripts or, or, or copies for, for clients, there is always a superficial uh, what you're telling them and then the underlying what you're trying to actually communicate. Yeah. Could you like, maybe give an example of like what a script of like what you're trying to tell them something but then what you're trying to communicate. It seems like there's two different messages you want them to, to receive. So, so for example, a superficial message could be, oh, are you tired of uh, uh, having to wake up 9 to 5 and all that where you could actually spend more time with your kids or... So, we usually have um, the, the script that spells it out and then underlying we would have visuals to 
to bring across that, oh, um, have your kids been missing out? Or have you been missing out on special moments, things like that? Or um, do you deserve better? So we tend to consider both parts of things. Some things it's best not to spell out. or So it's best for the like audience to realize it on their own? Yeah. On their yeah. own reflection? Yeah. Because it might be more powerful in a sense since they thought that they realize it on their own. But unknowingly, it's actually through your message, you cause them to realize it on your own, which makes it more powerful. And that's what, that's what I, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. All right. Okay. So you mentioned that businesses that in finance, uh, seminars, selling higher ticket items. So, so what is an example of high ticket items? Is it like a thousand dollars, 10,000? So what's the, the number? Usually a thousand and above. A thousand and above. Yeah. Okay. So if anything below a thousand, then this approach would be harder to work. Let's say someone who sells a product, $500. It would work. It's just that if you were to look at the numbers, um, usually media buying, so how much do you spend to acquire a lead and in terms of the conversion, the lead, uh, what's the percentage that turns into a sale? So with a higher ticket item, you have more space for that, that number to work out to be profitable in terms of that margin rather than uh, say $500 and let's say if one lead is $100 and your conversion is 20%, then you just break even. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, from what I'm thinking, maybe those people who own like online store selling bracelet like $5, $10, this method is not going to work for them because their items are like so low cost value. Possibly. Possibly. So, that could be like a loss leader lead generation kind of thing okay. to so, sell something. At the back end of that might cost a thousand or ten thousand dollars yeah. that could still work in the long run so they probably will need something on the back end to offset their entire marketing cost yeah okay so do you what are maybe some business that you feel that they they are not suited for this approach at all i usually wouldn't want to like strike out businesses that's not suited maybe by nature generally there are certain things like uh, branded e-commerce stuff and all that that um, it's not a common practice for this type of ads um, but I always think that you could test it you could come in between meaning the element of like a direct response uh, applied but then done more tastefully with, 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 with the correct artistic direction and all that that could still work out okay so when you see branded so you're Referring to luxury goods like I don't know, LV handbag and stuff like that. Is that what you mean by branded? Yeah, so we take for example a Nike uh, shoes. Like we are always um, familiar with how Nike ads are ran where it's more moto driven, uh, vibe driven and all that. Uh, but Nike actually started direct response. Like, oh really? Oh, like, I didn't know that. Phil Knight would go uh, reach out to people and then say how sell the benefits of the shoe. So I think like say a new launch Nike shoe could possibly sell some of the features that way, but done in 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 a more tasteful way where it's not very in your face uh, to suit the brand direction. But I think the elements of communicating uh, some of the features could be done as well. Okay. Yeah. So let's say maybe someone listening now has a business that sells such product which is more of the higher end one. So maybe an example of me how you would try to sell this product in a more tasteful way as you mentioned like what are some of the thoughts that you would, you would try to implement to help them sell this kind of product. Um, so let's say for example let's, let's say I have the shoe now maybe not Nike uh, some other, other brand shoe or whatever and I want to sell this shoe using that method that you have just explained. So yeah. how should I then go about it? Because now I cannot go say you know this shoe is has all this feature, you know, you know, five days later, you know, uh, we will cut, close the cut, blah, 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 because it's too in your face, right? So how then should I sell this shoe in a manner that is not so aggressive, mm -hmm. right? And still can actually use the elements of direct response marketing to help me generate more sales. I think what comes to mind is something like the Dollar Shave Club video. So a, a bit of humor, uh, fun poke into that whole Think where you maybe throw throw rocks at 
the industry, a common practice, and then you could share certain features, but make it entertaining for people to watch so that they don't see it like a salesman trying to pitch, but it's uh, like an entertainment and then they get your point across that whole uh, entertaining video that, oh, okay, this is different because here, here, here. Okay. And at the end, of course, we still have must have the call to action, like, you know, go to this website to sign up. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. Okay. But if that isn't there, then would it be still considered direct response marketing since there's no more like call to action at the at the end? I, I, I don't know because the, the thing, like, I didn't go through a very uh, proper like, direct response training and all that. Um, for me, I didn't have any uh, copywriting training. It's more of like studying what is out there, some things I like and don't, don't like. So like when I write scripts, it's always oh, what I feel about this client and all that. And then I would structure it out. Then I would look at certain frameworks to like double check if there are any elements that are missing. So I usually do that in a more unstructured way. And then coming back to your question in terms of whether it qualifies as a direct response or not, I wouldn't be the best person to qualify it or not. It's just that I could tell that there are elements of direct response within this and that. Yeah. Okay. So let's say if we craft that message that you shared earlier, the one with humor, right? Then at the end, there's no call to action. Then how do we then track the conversions of like that that particular campaign or ad that you've run? So oh, there could be a call to action button to find out are there like certain ads sometimes would be better if it's left that way without any call to action and then it's more of a pull than a push and you could from a media buying um, overarching view that could be the first touch point where you have other ads that could have that call to action where they would come to take action later but let's so let's say if it's uh, Rainer having a charity drive, you, you don't want to have that element that has a call to action like, oh, uh, come and sign up for this and all that. So that could be one touch point that people know that side of the brand. And then afterwards where they see the other ma uh, main offer ad, then they would consider that, oh, I know this brand has um, this exposure here and there and then they would take the action considering the different touch points that they were exposed to. Okay, so from what I'm hearing is that that, that one is more of like branding awareness not maybe just giving value up front no call to action then yeah. once people are like maybe getting a positive value positive feeling associated with it future ads down the road that might contain call to action they would possibly have a higher conversion since they earlier you have like kind of like meet them earlier mm. and they're familiar with you. So that's what's the purpose of the ad to yeah. build that familiarity, trust and positive. Oh, actually like framing. So what framing is, or what I come to learn about framing is, it's more like there are certain elements that are not spelled out. So just like a spectacle frame, you set the frame around it that people may not necessarily see, but it is that frame that creates that lens that you want people to have that perception to look. So for example, if you want to communicate that uh, I am rich and successful, by you telling people that, hey, I'm rich and successful, it may, may not be the best approach. But then you have certain elements like, oh, uh, a newspaper feature, awards here and there, and then uh, certain telltale signs and all that. Um, then that would form all the indirect frames that help people to come to their own conclusion that, ah, I think this person has made it. Okay. Think, yeah. So this is what I think in social psychology, they call it heuristics and mental shortcuts that people yes. use to come up with a conclusion. Like this yeah. guy drive Ferrari, should be rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rolex, blah, blah, blah. Should be rich. Okay. So... Maybe earlier we talked about, I think so far, the benefits of direct response, right? So maybe what are some of the downside of this, this approach? Most times it could annoy audiences, especially when people repeatedly 
see these kind of ads. So one thing about direct response ad is usually it is accompanied by very high energy, hypey um, thing, hypey vibe, especially when it comes to video. And if every time I want to watch YouTube and, and then this pop up, like if I see this three times a day, I might get annoyed. Okay. And and like for me, certain times, I wish I had um, the ad blocker for YouTube, but then I have to be aware of what's happening in, in, in the industry and all that. So I don't subscribe to that, but I could relate to oh, why some people uh, just like hate on this personality that keeps appearing and all that. So with that in mind, whenever I or we would film clients, sometimes we would tell them to oh, tone down your energy or we would find ways to still make the ad work but not annoy people in that sense. So what are some of the things that you guys do to annoy people less? Maybe less cheap, like hey and then <laughs> um, things like that. So it could get people's attention but then if I were to see that whenever I want to watch a video, it interrupts me and then I'm like, I don't care how good your product is, I will not buy. Mm. And, and, and so sometimes where our clients tend to be overly high energy, we tend to tell them to slow it down so that you don't sound like a salesperson. Um, ideally, you want to sound like a doctor that says, I, ha I have something that is good for you. If you want it, check it out. Rather than, please check this out, buy my stuff. Mm, okay. So it's definitely, I, like for what I'm seeing, those shoppy live, they're actually quite aggressive by right, selling their stuff. So it cannot be that kind of style. Uh. Was it way can be. So it really depends on like the client that we work with. Mm. And we have to really gauge what is their personality, like their energy level, and what is actually the audience perception of them already. So, and we would have a variety of different media assets that some has high energy, some is uh, toned down, some so shows a, like a softer side of them to bring a more holistic uh, experience of what that uh, brand is or what that personality is. So you're always trying to maybe match the personality of your clients that you have? Yeah. Rather than trying to make them something that they are not because it's uh, more different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm also thinking on the other end of the spectrum, like you say, very intrusive, right? And turn a lot, of, a lot of people off. But at the same time, might it also be possible that it also captures the attention of a lot of other people that those that it repulses, like very polarizing. Either you segregate this group of people, but at the same time, you capture the attention of this group of people as well. So overall, would the net outcome still be actually pretty positive, even though you annoy people? Yes, so we tend to balance that whole experience. There will be some that would be very attention-seeking and those would possibly be the ones that convert really well. But then we would inject a few other uh, forms of, of, of ads that would balance out that whole brand so that it wouldn't be that one-dimensional. Okay, yeah, got it. And... As you run your own uh, agency, right? so what are the type of maybe things you look for before you decide to onboard a, a new client? Firstly, their product has to work. So I have, um, there will be people that say, oh, I can pay you. We, we want you to help us. We know about your track record and all that. And then I have a gut sense that the product isn't very right. Mm. Um, and then digging further, it's like Ponzi, scheme. So those are usually things that you wouldn't want to touch because you know it might work. You amplify it, but you might be amplifying the wrong stuff. So I think ethically, we want to look for products that we are proud to amplify. And then once that is done in terms of the product works, they can fulfill the increase of demand in terms of backend. Then we what we would do is we, if we can imagine how certain angles would work out with that person and if we say, okay, this could possibly work, then we would work with them and 
find out more about what are certain potential angles that that has worked for them, they have not tried and all that, and then come out with different creatives. Okay. What if, let's say, the person has a right ethics, product is good, but maybe the price point, as you mentioned earlier, need to be at least 1K and above. Maybe his yeah. price point is like, I don't know, five, six hundred bucks. Doesn't meet that, that, that threshold of price point. So from then, right, what, what would you do in such a scenario? For, for us, especially in our earlier days, where we are less stringent with who we work with, so we thought, oh, great product. I like this client and all that. Let's work something. And a lot of times, what we work with was like a profit sharing model. So, like certain times after a long time, I wouldn't say long time, but after like a few months of working and we realized that the price point wouldn't bring any profit to us, we've been like working for free. So, over time, if there is traction in terms of the ads and all that, we would come in and help in terms of the business model, how you price certain stuff so that you get the profit that you deserve and then we get the cut that we can have. And usually that will work. There are clients that we would test out like from 1,000 to 2,000 month on month and then those would work to a point where there's a diminishing return then we know, okay, that's that sweet spot of the price point. Okay, so you test the different price po- price point till you get diminishing return and you s- use that as the like the optimal level. Hmm, okay. You mentioned earlier like, I think for a lot of people listening, you mentioned profit sharing. So how does the compensation work, work for you? What's the like the arrangement like typically? I think different agencies have very different arrangements. Um, ours, if it comes to profit or revenue share, it's more of say revenue share is how much we bring in from our leads and then you give us direct cut from there. Profit share would just be that amount minus the amount of ad spend that we spend on your account. And then that profit, you give us a cut also. What's the difference between the, the first, I mean, the two that you just mentioned? Sounds well, okay, very similar. Like, like say, let's say if my lead comes in and then I make you $100. Okay. So if it's, say, 15%, I take $15. Then if it's, um, the profit sharing is, let's say if, I spent fifty dollars to make you hundred dollars. So out of that fifty dollars, I'll take like fifteen percent. So minus the ad spend yeah. that you take that profit share. But usually profit share will take a higher percentage. Revenue share will take a smaller, smaller percentage. percentage. Because revenue share, you haven't deduct the the ad spend. Oh, you haven't deducted ad spend. Yeah. Okay, so okay, I understand. It's okay. just directly from how much my lead has paid you, and then we take a cut. Okay. So when you mentioned how much my lead has paid you, is that also from your ads that you run for the client or is your existing email no. data? So okay. the ads that I run for my client, we could track like who are the leads that came from our ads. And then if that journey shows that or oh, they have bought this, 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 then we would take a cut from that. Okay, regardless of whether the overall campaign is positive or not, you still get a percentage of it for that first option you yes. share. Okay, whereas the second option you will less of the ad spend, the net profit, so-called net profit, then from there you take a percentage yep. of it. So I, I'm guessing for most people will choose option two, right? Since it's like more black and white that it's so actually depends profitable. on the, like the option two would have a much higher percentage. So it depends on how much you scale. Um, usually the clients that have made a, a, a bigger amount would choose the lower percentage ref share because that would cover more stuff than us taking a bigger percentage. Mm-hmm. So maybe for those clients, they're already very confident that they'll be profitable. So they, are, they don't have yes. to worry about it. Yeah. Okay. So maybe the smaller one who is just starting out, I guess option two would make more sense for them where they're not sure whether they might be profitable yeah. or not. Okay. So let's say, for example, you know, what's the, someone, you know, reach out to you and you onboard them as, as a new client, maybe feel, hey, you know, product ethics, everything is great. So what's the process like of setting up a, a marketing campaign for, for this new client? I think first we look at what is existing, what they have existing. If they totally don't have anything, then we would start finding out like, what's your product like? What is your target audience uh, pain point? Uh, things like that. And then we start crafting out a few message tests. Uh, we would create their landing page, everything. So that full funnel until the point where the client interacts with them and then they close the sale. 
Oh, that's like a lot of stuff to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, from the client's point of view, all they need to do is just show up, do whatever they need to do, like presentation, and then that's it. Like everything else you will handle. Client, yes. Okay. But you earlier mentioned that for the ad spend, it's on the client's account, yes. not your account. Okay. Yeah. And then there's so many platforms out there, you know, you have TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, everything. So, how do you then decide, oh, let's go with Facebook. Oh, let's go with YouTube. What's your... Usually, we start with Facebook first because that's the... What is it easier to set up? But that's the where most people can be found Facebook, Instagram. And then um, YouTube is what tends to work better, especially in the seminar industry. I think it's just buying behavior. Um, so we usually test those. We used to immediately test TikTok, but so far what we have um, experienced is that TikTok doesn't sell high ticket items very well. So we have very good cost per lead, uh, cheap leads and all that, but then those wouldn't result into a high ticket sale. Why do you think that is the case? I think for one, it's just the user behavior. It's, it's, it's fast, short attention span, and people tend to want cheaper items and cut out immediately. So things that need more processing, I think YouTube would be a better platform than TikTok. Um, the other thing is maybe TikTok at that point where we are testing is 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 newer and then the demographic tends to be slightly younger than I think over time where older demographic comes in that may possibly work out. Right. And you mentioned that Facebook is always the first one to, to try and then always hear like comments right from the younger generation you know, Facebook is for old people yes. blah 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 yes, yes. seems to be working well for direct response also because our, our clientele based target audience tends to be slightly older so those platforms will work um, secondly is for YouTube there tend to be a teething period especially for a new account where first couple of months of us few thousand dollars would be burned where the algorithm takes a longer time to learn about what you're looking for whereas Facebook could work out much faster it's just that over time YouTube tends to be a more stable uh, platform whereas Facebook certain times could fluctuate a lot in terms of the results like I see like on certain Facebook groups they say that or they feedback that you know sometimes Facebook just shut down your account you know, and then you know, the algorithm just go crazy right but I rarely see people saying that on the YouTube platform. Is there any truth to that? No. Uh, yeah, yes, but from from our experience, we do face a lot of YouTube bans, especially um, us dealing with uh, financial ads, crypto ads and all that. Mm. So what we have back end is several accounts, backup accounts that should this one be down, <laughs> the other one. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes our job when things are running, it's not so much of a creative work, but a structural work where, okay, if this one is down, what are the other backups and how we can lead to different pages and things like that. So when you say like the accounts is like, you're talking about the YouTube ad account, it's not the client's, no, no, it's actually your agency's account. Uh, what happens is sometimes we will just create our own account, have the client put their card in uh, and then yeah, we do it that way. Okay. And then if let's say an account for whatever reason gets gets banned, then, then you have, have to, to use a backup account or yes. so we have to write in first and, and say, Oh, you could have made a mistake, blah blah blah. And then while waiting, sometimes it take forever, we have to start uh, running ads for the other accounts. Because usually there is a preview coming up. Yeah, and we cannot have too much of a lag time. And you mentioned earlier that for YouTube, you need some time to like for the algorithm to to warm up, right? And let's say if your account get banned, then you use up the backup account. Don't you also need some time for that new backup yeah. account to warm yes, up? Yes. And some lead time to Yeah, so so sometimes we have to just push through that. Sometimes for the backup account, we will just spend a little bit to keep it warm. And yeah. Okay. So is it like YouTube's way of wanting you to pay to play the game or is it just the way the algorithm is being structured? I think every platform wants you to pay. If you have an account manager, um, their advice would just to be, oh, you're not spending enough here and there. So I think for most part, their business model is just for you to spend more. But certain times, they still want to make sure that 
you keep spending, be- uh, as in, you get results so that you keep spending. But you only get results if your, I don't know, your ad copy, your ad is, is, is uh, you know, of decent standard, right? If it's lousy, yeah. then, then, you know, there's no way you're going to get results. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So you, you also talk about how YouTube algorithm takes time to kind of like warm up to what you want. So how, how does that process work? Like how does YouTube after that realize, you know, oh, you, your ad is meant to serve to this particular group of people. Like how does it over time realize that you want this, you want to target this group of people? From our standpoint, it's a little bit more of like setting things up and just really waiting in terms of, okay, the targeting and all that is right. Um, creative, we have a few variations to test so that we, from that standpoint, we could see which is the better performing one. But overall, we usually what we see is a higher cost per lead for the like, first month, for example. And then when it starts to drop, then we see stability in terms of, okay, this cost per lead actually makes sense. We can add in more money to scale it already. Yeah. So when you do like targeting on YouTube, if I'm not wrong, there are certain things you can target like maybe the country, the, I don't know, the interests, uh, other YouTube channels, are those like important stuff to let you to know upfront what are the things that you're looking for and, and you want to target or you kind of like leave YouTube to decide? You help me. We do, yeah. So so we do that in terms of what makes sense to the, to the, the first testing, the audience that we're looking for. And then from there, then we um, start alternative testing in terms of, okay, if this is working, these other ones could be possible things that could work as well. So we'd be constantly testing stuff, but I think overall, especially for Facebook, starting for the other platforms is that your creative, if it's good, the lousiest targeting would work also rather than the best targeting with very lousy creative that wouldn't. Okay, so creative is comes first, then the targeting is sort of like secondary. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's say what if an ad you run, right? I mean, maybe for, maybe for the audience who are listening, they are not sure what is a creative. Maybe we could expand what, what is a least a creative. Just anything you see, whether it's the image, videos that shows you or suggests to you about what this offer is about. Okay. Let's say you run a new ad campaign and a creative. It doesn't do well from the start. What is usually your reaction to it you cut it off or you try to improve on it try to improve on it and come up with a lot many other uh, alternative creatives to see what sticks so sometimes it's really like throwing whatever is out there at the start and then let the numbers tell you that what is working then from there you start gauging in terms of what variables you want to change to optimize it and then what other secondary angles could work in complementary of that primary angle that is showing you good results already. There's so many things that you can throw and then see what sticks at all. So I'm guessing you have like a template or framework yeah. to, to throw. I mean, you can't throw everything, but so you have certain things that you can follow and just keep throwing according to that, that mm. framework. So maybe what are some examples of like different things that you can just keep throwing, 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 throwing and see what works. Usually what the, the biggest shift would be the image or the video. So that would be the first thing that would make the biggest shift, then the headline, then the copy, uh, then the headline call to action button, then the copy. So it's usually in that sequence of where attention goes. The where the first point of attention, yeah. which is really the image or video. Yeah. Well, but video to reshoot is like a lot so, of work. So we will not reshoot the video, but we could possibly p- replace certain sequence of the video, change the background music, change, uh, yeah, to play around with certain things to see what might be the ones that people watch through longer and take action also. Mm. Also, I can imagine like at the back end, there's a lot of data analytics going on, like seeing at which part people drop off, which part people continue to watch, then maybe yeah. this can be recycled for future videos and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So how many people like you have to have on your team to you know, run this operation smoothly. We have a pretty small team. So our team is just like 10, 10 people, me and my partner, Joshua. And then um, most of the rest of the team is actually just overseas. So we have like video editors, uh, media buyers. We have a analytics person that gives us the number 
look through like Google Analytics or crunch number for us. Yeah. Could you explain what's a media buyer? Media buyer. So the the person that um, takes charge of all the different ad accounts. So Facebook dashboard, YouTube dashboard, TikTok, where they would create the ad campaign. Our video ed- editors, once they're done with the video, they would put it into the Slack and then with the copy in there and then they would just paste it into the ad dashboard and then they would be monitoring in terms of like uh, which ad to scale, which ad to cut, things like that. And is the media buyer and the analytics guy the, the same person or is it different, different person? Yeah. Right? So they tend to work hand in yeah. hand together. Huh? Okay. And let's say you, you, you change the ad, the creative, so like you say you run the ad, you don't do well, you change the creative, either image or video. And let's say if it still doesn't do well, at what point do you so realize ah, better to just cut the loss and then move on or it's more yeah. after a certain amount you kind of know if it will work or not then some so it depends on the client some clients who are more willing to spend we would test out certain stuff some clients that are very strict with their ad spend their profit and all that we would cut very early and then re-strategize in terms of okay this is what we are getting so far what might be other more sensible way to test this and then once we get that done then we do the second round of testing and see what kind of numbers we are getting so when you onboard a new client so it's very common for the client to actually see maybe the first one or two months to actually not make money on ad spend because you guys are doing all the testing and all the we tend to want to prime them that way so that if anything it would be a bonus that things work immediately for them so what's a, like a reasonable expectation for a client to come in to to, ex, to expect that their ads will start you know, becoming positive? I think reasonable would be one month of testing and then usually the second month will start working already. Okay. Yeah. And then scaling will be, come third month. Is it too soon for scaling on third month? It can be as early as second month also. Right. So if you're getting like very low cost per lead and those tend to be quality ones, then we will start scaling for them also. Okay. Yeah. And I would say cost per lead it depends on industry to industry. Like someone you mean property yeah. or investing, their cost per lead will, will differ greatly, right? Like property is selling maybe few million, few, few million dollar house. If your lead is like a thousand dollars still worth it. Right? I wouldn't say it goes to a thousand, okay. but yes, I think if you, if you work the numbers, if meeting a certain number of prospects and then closing to sale is this, percentage, then you can work back in terms of how much you're willing to um, spend per opt-in or per lead. Mm, okay. Yeah. So from what I'm thinking, actually those industries that deals with very high, extremely high ticket items like selling GCB, selling bungalow, yeah. you know, this approach is actually quite, quite, which is what we are seeing over now, you know, yeah. a, lot, a lot of uh, direct response heads on from the property side of things. Yeah. So those would work for them. But also because there might be a longer sales period before that close happened so they have to be emotionally stable enough to to tahan the tahan, yeah. dry period the yeah. not seeing. would it come to a point where if too many people use the same strategy then the strategy is no longer as effective yeah. yeah like now in the finance space i think in singapore i mean actually all along there's quite a few seminars running but yeah. Has it come to a point, is it reaching to a point where you find that oh, it's too saturated, this is, you know, difficult to, you know, keep doing this for the next, you know, I don't know, three to five years? Or is there still some way? I think yes and no, in the sense where if you're talking about the overarching uh, fact that this is still education, then I think over time, there will be always new, a new generation that wants to learn or equipped with certain skills. But in terms of how things are being done, I think from time to time, there will be changes as to what would be working. And it's usually a bit cyclical where if everyone is doing this, then for you to do something that used not to work, would work because it's like a zigzag thing. And yeah, so usually when, when everyone is doing that, then we would test like an opposite approach to see if, those things will work or not. So, when you're saying like, if everybody do this thing, are you referring to like, certain way the, 
ad creative is being run in this very similar manner. Yeah. Then so in terms of how it's being run or just could be the style. So for example, um, we have a client that when he first started, everyone in the industry, and that was like a physical workshop. So everyone in the industry were wearing suit and tie, things like that. And for him, we just said, okay, you just wear your t-shirt, slippers, and then um, stand in your bungalow with your cars and all that and just, just speak. So we wanted to brand him as like a, a rebel uh, that is not very polished, but he could achieve what he has achieved and so could any of you. And then we really went that different direction and that whole image took off. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You do a lot of uh, education, like, you know, seminars, or maybe even Zoom, right? Is there any industry that you have clients that is outside of this, uh, like, you know, seminar niche? We have e-com clients as well. Not many. We do have, like, education, tuition centers, things like that. Um, but primarily, what... Um, we are most used to doing or the thing about us is that we, we never advertise our services. So it's usually current clients that friends ask, oh, who's doing your marketing? Can we approach them as well? Or clients would share. Then it's usually word of mouth that people come and approach us. Nice. Yeah. L- later, part, I'm going to ask you how you got started with, you know, this entire approach since you mentioned that <laughs> there's no formal education behind it. So, but, but we'll get to that later. Huh? So, okay, maybe now back to the ads. Let's say you run a creative ads. It does well at the start. Never that it starts to falter maybe because many people copy what you do yeah, and things like that. So what's your, what's your next step then when you know this happens to your campaign? I think the key thing about marketing is just keep testing very aggressively. Um, so the approach in terms of, okay, if this approach has been, or this style has been saturated, um, the easiest way is to look for references outside of your market. So let's say if Singapore is this market, then you could look at overseas what has been working and if that approach could be very different from what is already running in your local market, then you could test those out. Um, or different industry, let's say if seminar market, it's all about this style, then you look at how certain um, aircon services run their ads or, or, or e-com and then you say, oh, actually that sort of element could be applied. Let's test that out whether it's an image or video. So we would try and be as open as possible in terms of what could be possible and then um, always test things out. Okay, just a quick one. Do you know that you can download the transcript of this episode? This way you can easily recap the lessons and insights of this episode without having to listen to it again. And that's not all because you can also download the transcripts of all my past episodes and quickly catch up on what you've missed. So if you're interested, go down to reynateo.com slash script. Script is spelled as S-C-R-I-P-T. So once again, it's reynateo.com slash script. Now, back to the show. You mentioned aircon, right? I think I saw a few aircon ads. I guess it's a viable approach to serve people in the aircon business. Yeah. Aircon, cleaning services but their price point seems very high I don't want to clean aircon like you know $300 like, seems like on the low end but the numbers can still work out maybe so maybe if the thing about low end is that also means the friction to taking action is lower mm. so that could possibly mean the cost per lead it's also coming. lower yeah ah, and right. with that then aircon you could have like one year package yeah the subscription like service yeah, yeah. 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 So then, then nowadays you have, you know, tools like ChatGPT, MidJourney, have all these AI images and stuff like that. How has that impact, you know, the work that you guys are doing? I think it, firstly, it, made, it, it makes research much easier in terms of uh, can you come up with a certain point form for us to either take it from there to create a script or we could have just brain dump things and say, can you refine this? And then once they refine it, then we would, try to humanize that that whole script a bit for clients. Okay. Yeah. So, 
a script writing part very use, useful. Lah. Yeah. So for the clients, when let's say you give them a script, I'm guessing there should be a, there'll be a teleprompter where they can just read off so it, they don't have to memorize it and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Does that affect like maybe the... How natural it looks. Yeah, that's, that's my question. So, so certain people are quite natural in the sense that when they read, then um, you couldn't tell. It, it's just like they're, they're talking. So those are very easy. Then there are clients that you could see their eyes moving, uh, things like that. And, and we would have to check and then say, okay, can you try this? So those would take a longer time. But usually, even with the ones that um, struggle a bit more, the end product, usually people wouldn't be able to tell like you are reading or if they know you're reading, it's not overly distracting to the actual message that you are reading out. Okay, so it's not really that important whether you're reading out like a robot or you use natural. It's not too important. It doesn't matter too much to the conversion. Mm, so far, no. Okay. And... AI images. So nowadays, this AI can create a lot of AI images. Yeah. It looks fake, lah. One look. Yeah. Does those does those help improve conversion, or it doesn't? Doesn't or natural real world images is still better. I don't. I wouldn't say it helps improve conversion, but it is a very fast way to test out something. So if if I have a, an angle, and before I want to turn it into a video script or video or things like that, I'll just get an AI image out to test if this angle bites or not, and that would be the fastest way for us to test things out. And a lot of times, some of these AI images actually work and we run them for quite a period before um, the ad takes out and we would replace them with an actual video from that ad angle. So from an e AI image and then change it to a video. Could you give an example of how an image definitely can replace it by a newer video? Uh, yeah, so, so for example, it's like... Um, are you, are you tired of working 95 very basic angle and then you, you, we could generate like an Asian uh, guy or lady uh, feeling tired feeling tired or, or neglecting like family and then family at background and if you could generate something like that and so that could be one angle out of say five different AI um, angles that we are testing mm. so from there we could have a better gauge in terms of what are the topics we want to focus on in creating a longer form video. Oh, okay. So let's say the image that does well is the person feeling really tired, very yeah. shack, you know, depressed. So when you create a video, you make sure that the cast or the person in the video is something along those lines are feeling tired. Like, are, are you sick and tired of this, this, this? And then that would be what we would front load in terms of problem realization. Okay. So it doesn't mean that the video look has to be similar to the no, image that we just share, know like. that this is what people take action on and then we could explore different approaches to that same topic. Mm, okay. So let's say if like you were to set up a marketing campaign, say let's say for my business, I'm in the business of selling uh, trading education courses, right? And let's say it's priced about, you know, 2 casing. How, how would you then, you know, go about uh, running a campaign for, for such a business? Okay. So let's say imagine one of your clients happened to be me or someone like me selling uh, online trading yeah. courses. The price point, let's say for example, is $2,000. Mm. How would you then go about running a, such a campaign for such a business? I think like what I mentioned earlier is like first see if you have existing Except things that has worked for you and then explore like okay if this is an existing business who are the people that are paying you already and what are certain commonalities that we can find certain pain points like why did they choose you in the first place what have you been um, excelling in for them and then once we find the, the strength and weaknesses in terms of that business, then we could craft out certain things in terms of what we want to shout out, what we want to avoid and and um, craft out certain angles to start testing in terms of maybe the fastest would be image ads first. And then from the image ads, the results we get, then we would create videos from there. And like for example, I don't know, your clients, some of them do physical seminar, some of them do online uh, Zoom yeah. webinar, I suppose. Are there any that does Zoom webinars, but it's recorded? <laughs> so they record once and then, you know, people sign up to the landing page, they watch the recording and then convert. W would, does that approach, uh, uh, you know, does the numbers make sense for using such an approach? Yeah, I, I, we have clients that are doing that. Uh, and 
over time after testing the content of the live webinar that is replayed um, through the through the month, the conversion don't differ much. Usually live one works the best, but then if the numbers don't drop as much for the pre-recorded ones, then that will make sense for it to be automated already. Yeah, of course they can do it like instead of every month, one time can do like four, five times a month, right? Since yes. the recording, oh, that's nice. Hmm. But then people, because sometimes I do live yeah. where people ask, is this real or not? Then <laughs> it's good. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Would people then know that whether, hey, is this a recording or is this live or it's so seamless that it's very hard to tell? The thing is because from the recording, there is already response. That is the, the the comments in that live recording is also replayed in the pre-recorded one. You mean the comments that are coming yeah. through? Okay. So from that timestamp and all that, it seems like it could possibly come across as live. Um, it's just that certain times when you ask questions, <laughs> the speaker wouldn't respond directly to that. So okay. if if and if the speaker happens to be like, oh, um how many of you feel this way then oh Sally I see your answer blah 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 and then if yours come out in that pre-recorded one and he skip yours then you're like weird <laughs> okay <laughs> so they, they might feel left out like, in that sense yeah I think so I think the thing is we don't necessarily want to bluff like oh this is life but I think we bring it across that um, it's, a, it's a great thing that this could be pre-recorded and if it's pre-recorded, that content or whatever would still work. Okay, so you let them sort of like know ahead of time that it may not be live. La. Depends on the clients. Okay. Um, certain times, so the most direct one is, um, oh, you missed the webinar. Would you like to have access to the recordings of this? Mm. And then they would, so they would di directly know it's recorded. Yeah. There are ones that, um, oh, our next one is this. And then the next one, we didn't tell them whether it's pre-recorded or live. They will just watch and um, come to find out for themselves if they sense certain things like, hey, how come he's not responding to me? Then it could be pre-recorded. Okay. Yeah. But you mentioned that, hey, you missed the webinar. So for that to receive like the recorded version, they have to miss the web the webinar la, to get the recorded yeah. version. Yeah. Okay. What if you tell them upfront, hey, this is an on-demand training, it's recorded ahead of time. Will that affect the, the numbers if you tell them upfront? Uh, it would affect in the sense where if it's live and you're participating, then people tend to be more attentive. Like, mm -hmm. um, but then if they know if it's uh, pre-recorded, they may just ah, yeah, so be they, less committed in that sense. I see, I see. And then, if I'm not wrong, I think there's some webinar tools where even though it's a pre-recording, you can have like a staff on standby to answer any live questions yeah, 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 yeah. for people who happen to be live, right? Yeah. And that kind of like maybe, I don't know, does it make it feel more real? <laughs> Since I, guess, someone... I guess. I okay. guess. And it doesn't take away the experience from the person watching the pre-recorded because they still get the content and they still get their questions answered directly. Yes. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, nowadays the tools are quite crazily scary. Because eh? yeah. <laughs> nowadays like, I still do like once a month and, and, and live. So I'm thinking, wow, if I can have like pre-recording, numbers don't drop that much, that would be really nice. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, okay, maybe we can talk maybe some of your some of your failures. What are some of your failures and what do you learn from it? Maybe you can keep it within the context of, you know, this the business that you're in. I wouldn't I wouldn't re really say failures, but like learning experiences yeah. from uh like certain clients when we work with didn't work out. And 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 usually when that happens, we are the first to tell the client that hey, this might not be working. Uh, you could you could you could end the service or things like that. And so from our point is that we take pride in the kind of work that we do, where if the campaign over time does not work out, the client wouldn't say that, oh, we got cheated by them. Because from the standpoint they know the different things that we are, have tested for them logically, what works and what did not, and just so that the numbers um come back that, oh, this does not make sense. And it really depends on what their testing period is. So if their testing period is short or they don't have a lot to spend and if we have crossed that threshold, then we would tell them that it, so far, if I were you, this is something that I would say would not work and it's your decision whether you want to spend more to test different 
angles or a different approaches or maybe like for certain industry, like I would suggest you go direct rather than mass advertising from Facebook and all that. Maybe like LinkedIn direct messaging will work for your industry. Mm. Yeah. And those clients that let's say, you know, you they choose or you tell them not to, to continue with you. Is it usually due to a low ad spend budget or are there like other reasons that comes along with? Um, usually low ad spend budget can be a contributing factor. So the, we are very fortunate that we don't have a lot of such cases. Most it's either work fairly well or ac- we actually like, totally transform their whole business. So we are very fortunate in the sense that the clients we work with tend to be very ambitious. And so it's not solely our part, but um, their their drive and personality actually help propel that whole business where our result seems really good as well. Um, but for the few clients that after a certain time it didn't work out, then um, sometimes it's just the platform doesn't work. So like, especially earlier days, they want to say, hey, I have this, can you test it out for me? And they would say, oh, okay, we, we test it out for you. And it's just so that the testing period proves that it actually, you could have spent your money somewhere else. Um, there are also times where clients would um, want to test us out and then we let them know that this is an industry that we're not familiar with. I can test it out for you, but I'm just letting you know that um, there will be a learning phase for us. And then after a certain time, then they're like, okay, actually the other agency is producing cheaper leads than you guys. So then I say, okay, then all the more, it works better for them because they may be more familiar with this. And then I will just catch up as friends and all that. And, and I will tell them, okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll be actually the one that, 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 that will say, hey, then, then don't, don't, don't feel bad that you are, you are cutting the service and all that. Because I think, um, as a business owner, I know how it feels in terms of engaging agencies, um, agencies dragging time or the worst locking you into a, a period contract. So for us, we never ever do that for clients. Like anytime it does not work for you, cut us. Yeah. So like people approach you to test. I mean, open mouth is easy test, but there's a lot of work on your part. So is there any upfront fee that you have to charge them so that, you know, your time testing is worth it? So over time, like oh, if there is, the client has a certain reputation in the industry proven, then it's easier for them to, for us to just say, okay, we just test it out for free. Um, for clients that we're not very sure of, then we start charging like a start, start, setup fee, startup fee, and then even retainer before we talk about profit sharing. Mm, okay. Yeah. But in the early days, you didn't implement this. It's only like when you no, got more yeah. bigger than that's where you, Yeah. Okay. So what are some of the challenges that you, you're facing in business right now? So right now, while running the agency, my partner and I, Joshua, is running our own e com as well. And that was something that we wanted to start just many years back, where we saw that the agency model is something that we love, but something that we wouldn't want to scale. It's not that it cannot be scaled. It's just that we don't like that business model. So identifying that, then we start um, looking into what sort of e com products we can where in, in a very naive and ideal sense, it's more of like, we don't have to show our faces. We are hiding behind a product or a brand and to scale it is just by adding more ad spend. Uh, of course, backend logistics and all that, but that would be more scalable, especially internationally than selling a service where um, it's still highly dependent on both our creative and for us to problem solve when, whenever things happen. So I guess the challenge is scalability. That's one of the biggest yeah. challenges for, for the agency model. Yeah. Mm. Okay, scalability. Then for e-commerce, out of course from agency and then to e-commerce, is it very like, the very, there's overlap in terms of what you do? Yes, yes, yes. So in another sense, our own brand could be seen as another client that the our our marketing agency backend is fulfilling 
like I think every business is a marketing business and and so from that sense um, on the back end we are still doing marketing for this it's just that instead of um, this being a client it's just ourselves yeah. and let's say for e-commerce now that you're selling physical product how would then things be different in terms of the I don't know, the, the ad creative running of the ads compared to, you know, offering a, like a education service in the finance industry? I think for us, it's pretty different and there's a learning curve where we want to brand it as a more premium luxury product. So uh, we will definitely tone down in terms of the very in-your-face direct uh, response. We focus more on bit more on imagery. So we st sort of study like, okay, how a luxury brand looks and act. And then from that standpoint, we try to emulate certain way where, okay, they don't necessarily like, give a lot of discounts and all that. And we have to have that discipline from the very step where we don't have sales to not be overly tempted to, to, to slash our prices. And so over time with that, then when people buy, they're used to the, the, the retail price and um, when the product works then um, it, it it sells for itself so for example um, another failure prior to this uh, e-commerce brand was that we were selling supplements so generic supplements overseas and that model has worked for um, many people who did that but for us we were just breaking even and we were even like paying more um, models, influencers to endorse our products and all that. And the thing is, we come to the realization that this ex exact formula, if we were to go to Amazon, there are so many others that share the same formula, but just slap a different label. And my partner and I are saying, that do we want to really spend so much more effort um, working on something that we know wouldn't? last or we wouldn't really believe in. And that's why we say, okay, let's not do this anymore. And then let's create something that we would uh, want our like family good enough to consume it ourselves, have our family consume it and know that this thing really works. So we started from scratch in terms of uh, finding like a, a supplier that could formulate a, a good product and have the best ingredients. We know what is behind that product and then we put in our own money to, to start that. So it's still in the supplement business, but more of the higher end yep. supplement. Okay. So like thinking back, like, you know, when you venture out to do supplements, generic supplements back then, right? What would you have done differently knowing what you know, know now? Nothing much in the sense that we know that that whole experience was to test out and the results we got was that oh, it wasn't as easy as we thought. Um, there was like a, a whole learning phase and our decision is that if we were to push through, I'm sure things might work out but from a, a longevity point that are we very proud of this formulation? No. So we wanted something that we know is unique, have a, uh, a longer runway and then we would be um, like heart and soul behind this product that this really worked rather than playing a marketing game where we are um, hyping something up but it's actually a generic product that you could have um, find someone that is willing to sell for half the price. Mm, when you say all the ingredients is similar, right? Yeah. So actually on Amazon, there are like many products with same ingredients, but just different label. Uh, yes. Because it ties back to the supplier who can actually do all this. Uh. Yes. And where is the supplier usually from that does all? For that, for that particular one was US, so it's like a white labeling where they have a range of, of products that you can white label. And you just pay a subscription, buy, order your own label, and whenever the, an order comes in, they slap it on for you. Wow. Yes. That's how, so you don't even need to have that supplement in your own logistic warehouse. It's no. on your warehouse. So it's easier to start up. Um, if I were to do it all over again, I would still go to that route in terms of it's easiest to test. Mm. So once we have certain experience in terms of, okay, how ads are ran and all that, then we take that and then put into our own product that we 
no would work better. Meaning you you handle the logistic all this yourself, is it? Yeah, we right now we do that, but we can easily outsource it to a third party as well. Okay. But you want to do all this logistic and maybe creating all this supplement yourself because you want to ensure the highest quality standard. Yes. And also because from an experiential standpoint, so so our market now is Singapore. And then we have a lot more um, control over like what we add in. Um, the, the the different, um, we even like, add scent into the, the, the box. So when they open it, they could mm. have a different experience and all that. So I think that is something that's important to us where the very subtle um, stuff plays a part to the whole experience and we wanted to just deliver the best. So right now, is the product that you're selling, what, what's the product that you sell now? I mean, you don't have to share the, the name of the company, but yeah. you know, it's, it's like, like a beauty supplement. Okay. So like, because supplement is, is so... Wide. Competitive. Yeah. And, and you no, know, like for example, like new fitness, you have like, you know, creatine, whey protein, you know, seasoned protein, multivitamin. There's so many products that, that, that someone can sell. So how do you then, at the start, right? You know, let's do in your case beauty or someone else, maybe let's say do creatine. How do you then decide which supplement or types of supplement you want to sell? So for us, we, it's, it's combination of few things. So first, it's like we know what's available. Like speaking to different suppliers and all that, we say, oh, actually there is, instead of a pill form, there is a jelly form. And so it's easier to consume. And then from our standpoint, what we, when doing research on the market, what people tend to do is that they have different products for different things. And that could work for um, different target audience. But for us, it's like, okay, if we want to target people who are like busy and and the thing about beauty is that you have like uh, beauty routines, like a five step, 12 step and all that. And a lot of times these don't work, not because it do doesn't work, it's because you don't stay consistent and it's, it's troublesome. So we wanted to combine everything to just one jelly that is enjoyable, uh, easy to consume, and then it has all that necessary things inside rather than taking different pills and powders and all that. So we come from, we value add from that whole process standpoint and also to ensure that the quality of each ingredient is is the highest form. Mm. So you, you work backwards, first you define your audience persona and then you find out what's your pain point and then that's how you come to this beauty supplement. Yeah. Then my next question is, how do you then find the supplier? Like, no, that this supplier can do this thing that you're you're looking for. Google. <laughs> oh, Google. So yeah. Singapore has like supplier in Singapore that actually does this. Uh, our supplier is in Taiwan. Mm. Uh, but I think the best way to start is attending trade fairs, talking to different people, different vendors and knowing what their process is. Then over time, um, my process was that I attended trade fair and then after speaking to this particular supplier and actually learning a lot, then I realized, no, this this one doesn't really work out. They're not very, that experienced. So I Googled for alternative while waiting for answers. And then I found some other supplier that um, are actually producing for the top brands here. And then I said, okay, I'll, I'll work with you. And because you have the expertise, you have the certs and all that. Hmm. Yeah. So trade fairs, so I'm not, not familiar with trade fairs. So I'm guessing this way all different manufacturers or vendors come to a particular event for a few days and yeah. they just showcase their product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm guessing your trade fair should be a health and beauty fair yeah. for all the different type of supplements. Uh. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it's actually quite different thing that you're doing compared to your agency model yeah. where because this is like a whole new business altogether where you have to find supplier and the logistic. Yeah. Uh, what about the logistic now that let's say supplier in Taiwan, let's not say, let's say someone plays an order would the supplier then help you package it and ship it out or is that no, so so for ours when we want to do our own formulation we have a MOQ which is the minimum order quantity and that would be at least a, like a five figure to six figure somewhere we have to throw in to commit to a certain quantity that they're willing to produce for us and then we buy in bulk so there's a huge risk that if we don't if this doesn't work out then that whole sum would be burned mm. Uh, so it's best to have some sort of testing um, in that sense. For us, we didn't really do that. We just like, okay, let's just um, ride or die with, with this. Mm. And we created a formulation that we thought 
make sense would work and we committed to it and then we started selling it. So I guess the selling part is very similar to what you do as an agency, uh, creating the ads for yeah. it and then running on Facebook, YouTube, blah, blah, blah. That's where your so-called expertise is overlap here. Yeah. La. Okay, so the different part is more of the creating of the supplement, the supplier, the logistics. Yeah. So when you buy the MOQ, do you have to store it at your own warehouse in yeah, somewhere? Oh, so so yes, we, we ship it all to our warehouse in Singapore. Mm. Um, the fortunate thing is my family business runs an e-com business also. So we do swimwear active wear. And then we do have warehouse, so I'm like, uh, oh, can okay, I rent re- a there. space <laughs> there to, um, and then we already had, okay, what, what, what uh, delivery are you guys using that works? So from that part, I, I had that advantage and it's easier for us to store it there. Um, we know um, the, the quantity, we know how it's being packed and all that. Um, I think a lot of times, uh, Josh and I would, on, on weekends when orders are high we would go and pack ourselves wow. and we do enjoy the process in terms of okay uh, we, we see oh where these customers stay and all that what what customer profile and sometimes we, we will even check them out okay oh, this is how they look on Facebook and all that so we're really obsessed in terms of uh, who are buying from us why are they buying um, so for example like we are selling like 30 days supply and in 10 days customers will buy again so it's a great thing but it's like how are they consuming this stuff are not cheap uh, are they taking it as snack and and things like so we research and see um, what kind of demographic we are reaching out to mm. now you got me curious let's say someone wants to start mm. doing this uh, e-commerce business, maybe not in beauty, maybe let's say in a, because I like, I work out at the gym, maybe come out with a new protein powder that tastes better than what the market is offering right now. So yeah. what are some of the first few steps this person should, should, should until, maybe me for example, what, what are the things should I look out for to get started? Trade fair, go trade fair and find different uh, protein supplier. I think first is like the market demand, if there is a market for it or uh, a potential for that, then from what is already offered out there in terms of that, even that saturation, how well can you differentiate yourself or niche yourself? And that is the simultaneous process as to the the trade fair that you attend, what are people producing? So I could speak to uh, certain uh, vendors and they are saying that, oh, we actually found this new strain of probiotics that uh, could increase muscle growth more so than the regular gut health that that you're producing and you could add that into your protein powder. So that could be an uh, interesting angle, firstly. Second is, in five years' time, would there be demand for this? So in terms of longevity, and then if those things kind of check off, then you say, okay, then let's look at your cost, uh, how much are people willing to buy and the margin that you can have for yourself then um, in terms of flavors or uh, uh, things like that will come secondary after that. Right, okay. So like to make sure that there's demand then you want to make sure that there are currently some of the best selling items in the market of course it really shows there's demand but because there's demand it also means it's very saturated the product there's so many different brands out there already. Yeah. So only do it if your product has a different angle to it or a certain ingredient or a certain thing that makes it stand out. Uh, I the, would imagine that it would be easier that way. Um, at, at least for what I believe, there are other people who say, oh, I don't want to think so much. Whatever that is working, I'll do exactly the same. i just press it cheaper. And that could be their business model that would work much easier. It's just that for, for me, I, I like to... Uh, brand things differently and, and take part in what I do. So it's a different game that I would like to experience. I think there are many ways to make money and then the business for me is a different outlet for self-expression or things that you want to experience and for that uh, each or that curiosity artistic um, think that is what I want to pursue in terms of, oh, let me see if I could tackle the premium market where people are spending a lot to, I want to say spending a lot, but um, being priced more than the competitors 
um, to buy a certain product and if this product would be good enough to give people the results that they would keep buying. Mm. So it's that whole um, process. Okay. Now maybe we can take a, a step back, right? And I'd like to talk maybe about, you know, earlier we shared like, you know, how did you actually get started with your agency business from the early days? Uh, how I got started? So, post-graduation, I joined my family's business and that was when the business was fully retail, brick and mortar. And my first thing in was, okay, can I bring everything online? So I started attending courses and one of the first few Facebook marketing courses I attended was um, done by Sen Clement. So it was Clement Wong, Sen Chiu at that time. And, and that was where I tested different stuff. I created my own um, website and then put all the SKUs up. So it was a fun and painful process of learning everything. Um, and then we have like three to 5,000 SKUs. So to put everything out was also as painful. Um, but that process gave me all the skills I sort of need to understand what this is all about. And the agency business really started after... Um, so my business partner, Joshua, he was looking for a job then. And this, this was like several years after me attending the course and running things. And then I'm like, oh, uh, I think Sen is hiring someone so go work for him. And I think the great thing about the, the, the company is that they do really good training. So a lot of people that were working there are agency owners now because mm -hmm. of such solid foundation that was pounded into them and also work ethic. So um, that was when I think after Josh left the company, he went to a few companies and all that. Then we wanted to say, hey, on your free time, we want to test out drop shipping or not. So that was what we tested. It did not work out. But then at that time where friends needed um, help with marketing, um, Chris being one of the first ones. And then we said, hey, let, let us help you with it. So when we got really good results and then it became word of mouth thing, then that became an uh, accidental business that we launched mm -hmm. together. And like, you know, how was it like having a partner, you know, to, to work with? Like, would you say that your strength and weakness complements with his strength and weakness? At, at the beginning, no, in the sense that we seem to be very similar people in terms of persona. Um, we are army buddies and how they make us into buddies is just by birthday. So the whole bunk, everyone is born in April. Mine is April 12th, his is April 15th. Mm -hmm. And so, closest. closest. And, 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 and they put us as, as a suspect, but, suspect buddy. So the good thing is that we have been through a lot of shit together and we have seen the worst of each other and and when we work together it's 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 pretty natural for us to understand what takes each other uh, what take one another and the, the kind of style that we like to work so it's only until um, one year in two years of working together where we sort of have better clarity in terms of what our strengths and weaknesses are. So for me, I'm a bit more creative, um, but less consistent where he is someone who would wake up really early every morning. He needs to have his morning routine, work out in, have breakfast at a certain time, lunch at a certain time and all that. And so over time, he is the ones, he is the one that oversees operation where he he uh, he enjoys like teaching, he enjoys talking to the staff and all that. And then for me, I, I kind of um, am the one doing all the creatives and also coming in and say, hey, how come this is like, so my job is to come in to poke hole as to what is already running. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so over time, we find more distinctions in terms of what he's good at, what I'm good at. And then we, we uh, find peace in terms of both are uh, different scopes. 
so then let's from a high level point of view, he runs the operations, you run the creative and booking of hosts. Then let me maybe like, you know, future direction, who's the one that kind of like say, hey, you know, let's try go down this direction, you know, and stuff. Is it like a joint decision or someone will it's, it's usually a joint decision, but uh more often than not, I am the one that like would dream a lot. So I was like, hey, what if we were to do this and all that? So the good thing about us is that we really enjoy each other's company. Like I will always drive him home and then we would talk about everything and including like uh like the the, the challenge that we're having now or um what could be like the two year plan, three year plan and things like that. So we would joke about like, oh, how big we could grow or actually it's not that important. Um having this holiday together and all that would be more enjoyable, things like that. And we would have all sorts of conversations. So through that, then we're like, hey, remember the time we were talking about this? I think we could do this now. Uh, things like that. So same for the supplement where many years back, we were saying like, Josh, if five years down the road, we are still running this, means we fail already. <laughs> and then you say, yeah, I agree. So over time, we have that seed planted that, okay, this is not what we want. This is not the business we want to scale, but this is what we enjoy doing in terms of we enjoy doing problem solving for clients, uh, filming, and 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 in, in in fact, we are just spending clients' money to learn marketing, mm. and uh, but then if we say oh we want a ten million twenty million dollar business, this is definitely not the vehicle we want to go. So having all that kind of chit chats gave us clarity in terms of the alignment and the direction we want to go. Hmm, that's really nice. I envy that because I myself, I don't have any partner that <laughs> can relate to. I mean, besides my yeah. wife, but she's not in the business. So, so yeah, it reminds me of uh, Adam Koo and uh, Patrick Chiu. Yeah, they're also two business yeah. partners and they, they really complement each other's skill set, which is very similar to what you just shared. So, so let's say someone who wants to, let's say, do what you do, run in an agency for clients, you know, doing marketing, you know, how should they then Go about it. Do you recommend they take up a Facebook course or you know understudy some other companies, pick up the skill set, and then start on their own? Or is there a better way of doing things now? I think there are many ways of doing it, especially like the agency business. The entry entry of barrier of entry is really low. So anyone who is even like in poly, they want to start their own agency, they could. And I think in terms of the structure of how it is, there are people that are extremely skilled and they want to... So it depends on the kind of head and role. There are people who are the practitioners that they are marketers themselves, they could do a good job and then they start learning the sales and business part of it to be it around. There are people who know nothing much about marketing but they could talk and close sales then that could work as well where they would just have to hire great marketers and that they bring a lot of business in and they pay them well. So I think there are many ways of doing that and it would be a nice start off point to start whichever business because I, I believe every business is a marketing business and this could be a good foundation where you learn about sales, you learn about marketing and then whichever business model that you really want to scale up, you take this experience over. Mm. So am I right to say that like, at this stage in your life, I mean, you mentioned about the e-commerce business, the agency, so you're looking to maybe grow the e-commerce business but at the same time still run the agency concurrently, yeah. but the agency is unlikely to grow from there. It's yeah. more like just stay where it is while the e-commerce one grow. Yeah. But you don't have plans to, let's say, not do the agency business and focus on the e-commerce? I think at this point where the e-commerce business is not Extremely, we just started this year. It's not extremely predictable. It is scaling up. Um, but the amount that we throw in is from the agency. So okay. we're making money from the agency to burn money to test out mm. the e-commerce business. And so there is a certain runway where we still need. And the thing is we still enjoy doing the agency business. We enjoy the, uh, the clients that we work with. So that's not something that we would want to cut um, but it's more of running it where it is without really looking for new clients to sort of expand this. 
So whenever a new client come in, we're more stringent now in terms of do we really want to do this? Do we have the capacity to really add value and um, make a good impact for them? If no, then we would refer them to someone else. If not, um, if we think yes, within our capacity and this is a challenge we have to take up then from the our e-commerce business side, we need to know that there is enough capacity for us to dilute our attention away from also. Yeah. So for the e-commerce business, what are some of the challenges that, that you face in the business right now? Uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, being new. Uh, first would be product market fit, which tends to be less of a challenge now that things are taking off. Then the next challenge would be, okay, um, I have one product now. What are the next few products to create that whole uh, brand line, product line? Um, working with different influencers, uh, affiliate program, how to pay them out well so that they would be motivated enough to um, produce content for us. Um, in terms of overseas market, what are the search that each different market is? So the thing is that when we were doing um, the US market, the great thing is that it is a big enough market that is, once you set that that one market is good enough and then you scale from there. For us, where we wanted things to be closer to home, uh, Singapore, it's a market that can pay but it's a pretty small population market. So us knowing that we need to expand to neighboring countries and then eventually overseas, first formulation has to be compliant to which market. So different market has different ingredients that are banned. Oh. And then that creates the whole complication in terms of, okay, if I were to use this, these are the markets that I would have problems facing. And then the language, the marketing approach to each uh, country within just Asia and then the certs and all that, that is like uh, a, a whole pain point that we have not directly experienced, but we would soon be facing. When you mentioned cert, it's like certification of that supplement. Um, the like you need to apply, like for Singapore HSA for the country, you need to apply, list down the ingredients and, and like for Malaysia, it can go as long as 12 months before approval. So yeah. Okay. And maybe let's talk a little bit about the personal side. So recently I see yourself, I see that you got yourself a, a landed property. So congratulations. Thank you. So I'm just curious to, to hear from your thought process, you know, what made you, you know, go with a landed instead of something like a condo? So what was your thought process behind it? I think for me, it was more of uh, investing while I'm still young. And then, um, Prior to this, I bought a condo. So condo, just park colonia. Oh, uh, yeah. And 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 after I saw it, then that, that proceed, um, family is like, oh, you are reaching the age where any older, you won't get the full loan, amount of loan. So we want to leverage on that, um, see what you can get and all that. So this would be a new family home that um, we, as a family, we're moving into and then just using the proceeds, um, bank loan name and all that to to get that. Okay. So it's more of a investment slash wealth preservation uh, since. Uh, yeah. Because I don't know, I recently attended a property talk when the guy is selling, uh, of course, a uh, landed. Uh, so their, their, their sales pitch or proposal is this, uh, they were just showing a diagram and graph. The yeah. number of landed in Singapore over the last 15 years, the supply is yeah. just very not moving and not even going up but yeah. very minimal yeah. whereas condo is like brrr, it's like no brainer like, you know supply and demand if something is low in supply yeah. naturally the value price will you know, go up over time so that was like you know their, their, their selling point which makes sense yeah <laughs> I mean, it makes sense yeah <laughs> and I know you you know you mentioned that earlier you, you there are certain things like you know the e-commerce business you'd rather not uh, people know the brand yet because of you know you want you want that the privacy. So if other people want to, you know, find and connect with you, do you want them to, to find yeah, you like yeah, your sure. social media profile and stuff like that? Yeah, so just DM me. Okay, well, uh, maybe you can, well, which uh, Facebook, I'm guessing Facebook? Yeah, or Facebook. LinkedIn or whatever. Okay, so what's your Facebook link right, so people can find you? Now there's a lot of imposter. Yeah, exactly how you approach me. 
<laughs> yeah. Fun fact, right? When I approached Sean for the interview, he thought uh, I'm the fake Reno, and he didn't reply me for like I think two weeks. Uh. So I thought he's ignoring me. Okay, lah, move on. Yeah, I think he replied after two weeks. So, so yeah. So so what's the do you have like the the handle slash Sean Sean Koo? IG, I think it's the same thing also. So either either one of them. Okay, could. I'll make their life easier. I'll put your link in the description below so people can find you easily. Yeah. And okay, I think that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, hey, what's up, my friend? So just one thing before you go. Do you know you can download the transcript of this episode? This way you can easily recap the lessons and insights of this episode without having to listen to it again. And that's not all, because you can also download the transcripts of all the past episodes and quickly catch up on what you've missed. So if you're interested to do that, then go down to reynatio.com slash script. Script is spelled as S-C-R-I-P-T. So once again, it's reynatio.com slash script. Go check it out and I'll talk to you soon.